So, the Hunt class escort destroyers, and, well, I did think about doing various ways of, you know, talking through this, but I thought I'd just leap into it. Because normally when I start talking about the Hunt class and call them escort destroyers, people go, ah, the Royal Navy didn't have escort destroyers, that was an American term. At which point I really would like, you know, one of those buzzers to follow me around so I can go, eh -eh. but that would be kind of cruel and nasty. So let me explain. The Royal Navy takes its sloop program to develop its small ships for anti-submarine warfare and escort operations in World War II. They're, it's a sloop program in the 1920s and 30s that they've developed this sort of this pattern system through. And I've been over the sloops, especially the Bitten class. They're in a previous part of this, uh, part of, well, they're, I think they're in Series 5, Keyship Series 5. And what happens is the Royal Navy is then ordering, in the run-up to World War II, Henderson's last bunch of orders. And they have the Black Swan class sloops going in, they have the Flower class corvettes, they have a class of conventional torpedo-armed small destroyers going in. They have a, a class of conventional la uh, conventional torpedo-armed large destroyers going in. They also order these, the Hunt class. Now, they're classified as destroyers because they are being designed for greater than 20 knots of speed. Uh, and when sloops are specifically supposed to be below 20 knots of speed because of the treaty standards that have come through... But they're not going to be armed with torpedoes. And they're going to be a lot smaller than the small destroyers. But they're going to be about sloop sized. But they're not going to be as versatile as sloop because, sloops because they can't be easily adapted from one role to another. In fact, they're specifically being built as escort vessels, as warships. So what do you call them? Well, here is where an interesting phrase does start to appear. The first idea is maybe we should call them frigates. They decide against that, because these are going to be using destroyer crews. They're going to be getting the officers from destroyers to crew them. That's where they're going to get their growth in officers and personnel to provide some actual experience for them. In which case, knowing destroyer officers are the type of officers that destroyer officers are, knowing that reservists are going to be overwhelmingly sent towards the flower class corvette force, they make a decision. Hunt class. Well, they're not small destroyers because they're not armed with torpedoes, but they are destroyers. That's where escort destroyer comes from in terms of Royal Navy technology. Basically, they look at the Americans who call who have escort and fleet destroyers to an extent in terms of their size, their size vessels, or destroyer escorts, and the same phraseology makes sense for the British. So that's where the Hunt class come in. This is why they are escort destroyers. So the Royal Navy technically has, at one point towards the end of World War II, under construction, escort destroyer, they have corvettes, frigates, sloops. Escort destroyers, small destroyers, medium destroyers, and large destroyers under construction. So Basically, in terms of escort, they have seven levels of escort ship under construction. By the way, medium destroyers are something called the weapon class. Large destroyers are the battle class. Then it's the C, a, a C H, C, K, all the C variations of the Cs are the sort of supposed standard fleet destroyers, small destroyers. Then there's the hunt class going through and still going on. And then, of course, we work down, we've got the Black Swan class sloops, we've, which are well, sort of their various level of military build. Then we've got the frigates, which have le are a sort of in-between between the sloop and the corvette in terms of its level of naval actual construction, naval star construction, military build versus civilian build. And then you have, of course, the flower and the castle class corvettes. Which is all the roundabout way of saying this is another method being taken of maximizing. Maximizing the capacity of yards. 
It's also a really interesting thing to consider in terms of if these had been ordered earlier, what could have happened? What could have been the case? Because the Hunt class, well, they're laid down in June 1939, a lot of them. They were ordered in March 1939. The design was pretty much standardized in December 1938. And... There was actually a discussion about ordering them earlier. There were designs going around for them which meant they could have been ordered in the previous year's financial cycle. I.e. rather than March and April, so the end of the 1938-39 financial cycle and the beginning of the 1939-1940 financial cycle, they could have ordered them in April-ish 1938. Eight. And that would have been really interesting because if you consider they're laid down in June 1939 and completed by March 1940, in the case of HMS Abstone and HMS Berkeley and quite a few others actually. If you count that back and you start probably about the same, June 1938. The odds are those vessels would have been in service long before World War II began. And that gives you an overwhelmingly interesting idea of what could have happened at the beginning of World War II. Because that is the Royal Navy's, you can argue, weakness at the beginning of World War II. Is that they've been planning on war in 1942 or afterwards. And so they just started building their small ship programs. If war had held off to 1942, Lord help anyone who fought them. Because they were building a lot of small ships. It would have been a very, very un capable escort force they would have been facing. Because also a lot of the problems that come up in wartime with Aztec, etc. That people sort of tend to focus in on. The fact that you need multiple ships involved... Uh, to t uh, multiple ships... Uh, especially the earlier version of Aztec, to maintain contact well enough one launches an attack from depth charges, etc., are all things which peacetime was so was solving. The throwers were under development, the mortars were under development, the better Aztec were all under development. And the trouble is it's wartime with the urge to get what you can in service now that actually pauses those developments, whereas peacetime would have probably seen those in service. So you'd have had far larger number of escorts, and they'd have been armed with far better weaponry. That's a scary scenario. And the Hunt class would have been a cornerstone of this, as they were... They were in many ways designed to bridge the gap between the capabilities offered by vessels like this, Trevor class destroyer, and the smaller destroyers. Trevor class is a large fleet destroyer. They were made to bridge the gap between that and the sloops. They were meant to provide the massive extra escorts needed for carriers, for battle groups, probably less so. They'd probably still be taking care of over the small, small fleet destroyers but and large fleet destroyers. But if you have the escort destroyers around, you can have your carriers, your supply groups... Your fast supply groups can all be escorted. Your convoys can be protected. Your merchant ships. All those things that matter. The sinews of war can be secured. Shameless book plug. And, ooh, well, there's a new version coming out in October. The second edition. I have to say, I just received my another a royalty check from it and well I have to admit the hundred pounds is going to be useful I'm not sure how many books that equates to having been sold since the last royalty check but uh, probably guessing not that many but I'd hope it's not that many because otherwise really short but thank you that hundred pound helps 
that will go towards pictures for the next book. That's how you live as an academic. And this is HMS Berkeley. And she's a really cool example of this class. Look at them, they're pugnacious. This is a hunt type one. First generation, built count by camel lads. Lost on the 19th of August, 1942, during the Dieppe Raid. She was incredibly useful. But think about that. She is completed by the 6th of June, 1940, in service. She gets over two years of service. She'd been ordered in 21st of March, 1939, and laid down on the 8th of June, 1939. She takes less than a year to be built. Less than a year. And let's consider what she can do. What the Berkeley does. Well, they have roughly a thousand tons standard displacement. Roughly 1,340 tons fully loaded. This is another of her sisters positioned up here, so you can see that. Uh, see an example. They, their power came from two Admiralty free drum boilers supplying two Parsons geared CO binds that drove two shafts with 90,000 shaft horsepower for a top speed of 27.5 knots, and normal displacement, 26 knots full displacement. And had a range of three and a half thousand nautical miles at fifteen knots, or a thousand nautical miles at twenty-six knots. Armed with four quick-firing four-inch guns, one hundred twos, Mark, mm, Mark sixteens, on two Mark nineteen twin mounts. You can see one positioned forward. You can see another one aft. Uh, the moving—it's the aft which is the interesting one, where they move things around. Four quick-firing two-pounder Mark 8 guns on a single Mark 7 quad mount. Uh, two 20mm Oricon guns in single mounts. They were P Mark 3s. And 40 depth charges, two throwers, and one rack. And this is also holiness picture. And so... If we consider the Berkeley and her career and her value, well... She would had to have repairs. She'd been damaged before. She took part in Operation Aerial, which, of course, was the evacuation of the British Expeditionary Force from Western France. Which, if we think about Operation Aerial, that takes place in the 15th to 25th of June. So she's literally completed on the 6th of June. She's in action. In a pretty darn important operation by the 15th. So with less than a week, which tells me that they've been working up with her, but also it's an important part of her systems. None of her systems are things which are new. The crew come in and they go, ah, yes, we know what that is. We know what that is. We can use this. We can use this ship. She's still got her new ship smell and she's going into action. An Operation Aerial is often forgotten compared to Dunkirk's evacuation, but it's just as important. And in many ways, far more scary, because there's far less able to support from the Royal Air Force and other things back in the UK. She evacuated the British Embassy staff, as well as um, all the uh, Raswits, Raswits, um, Raswits of the, and the Polish and Czech troops. Uh, sorry, that was terrible pronunciation on my part. I do apologise to the Poles listening. Um... Vladislaw, Vladislaw, Rakizoch, I think. I'm just mangling it even worse now. I, I spent time practicing this. She took part in, well, escorting the sloops doing mine laying operations in August 1940. She did anti invasion patrols in the English Channel in September 1940. She escorted convoys in October and November 1940. And in December 1940, she's damaged by a mine. Luckily, it was damaged in the midway. Uh, and so, well, if you're at damage in the midway, where do you go? She goes to the Chatham Dockyard. She gets repaired there. And very quickly. She's back in convoy duties in January 1941. 
she actually escorts HMS Icarus, the I-Class destroyer, uh, for its mine laying operations uh, off the French coast in February. And then for most of the rest of 1941, she's escorting convoys and patrolling the English Channel. So she's taking part in the home convoys, the coastal convoys. In February 1942, she actually took part in the attempt to intercept Scharnhorst and Eisenhower during the Channel Dash. Now that's interesting to me because what she was supposed to do in the Channel Dash can seem rather interesting because you've got Neisenau, you've got Scharnhorst. They are being escorted by destroyers, by torpedo boats. What is HMS Berkeley, who's some total of her anti-service armament, two twin four-inch guns going to really do? Well, this is where things get interesting, because you have to think about it as an overall force. The British are dispatching six destroyers, three of Hunt class destroyer, escort, escort destroyers, and um, roughly 32 motor torpedo boats as a concerted force. If you think about the German force, which is 26 Schnellboots, or E-boats, and 14 torpedo boats, that's rather 40 small vessels. 40 small vessels for which the twin 4-inch guns are going to be very deadly and very rapid firing. And she's going to present a far more stable gun platform for those guns than they necessarily are. She's also got fairly decent AA armament, and let's be honest, even the depth charges can be problematic for larger ships. Did I think, uh, is it a really a good force though, if that, you know, the British do manage to catch up with them? Um, I think if the British aircraft had been there to provide top cover and had managed to do attacks as well, coordinated in with the ships and they'd all got together, maybe. Myself, though, I would prefer... Well, I suppose at least with these you have the excuse of not be taking part in a torpedo attack on a Sharn Olsen Eisenhower. But um, I, I think I'd still prefer to be doing it with some cruisers and preferably a rather large member of the battleship collective of the Royal Navy present. But still, they were useful. They had a useful role. And this is the difference between them and the sloops and the frigates and the corvettes. They are able to do those 27 knots if they are in normal condition. If they're fully loaded, it's less, but they're able to do those 27 knots. And then, of course, we have HMS Holness. Now, I like Holness. I like her name, for starters. And these are named for hunts, but, you know, I like Holness. It's a, it's quite an interesting name in terms of Royal Navy history, in that there have been two named for it, and both have been rather interesting vessels in that. One was the Hunt-class Minesweeper, launched in 1916, commissioned in 1917, and sold off in 1920. Uh, well, 1924, paid off in 1920, sold off in 1924. And one, of course, is this vessel. And they have really interesting careers for little vessels. Holness herself managed to serve the entirety of the way through World War II. She is ordered, March 1929, she is laid down in June 1939. She's launched in February 1940. She's completed and commissioned in August 1940. She's not scrapped till 1956. She serves the whole way through World War II. She spent a whole of her wartime service with what was known as the 21st Destroyer Flotilla on East Coast convoys, which is a really scary prospect when you consider what gets chucked at them. There is this line at certain points, I've seen descriptions in books about her, where she's going, they go, no foreign service. And you sort of go, she spent her entire career on the East Coast convoys. The convoys were the Germans through Schnellboots, Torpedo Bomb, 
uh, aircraft, mines, submarines, everything at them. Sometimes all at once. Yeah, I, I know she didn't go far from the UK, but I, I think she, um, she earned her, she earned her chops for taking on that lot. In fact, in February 1942, she took on a Schnellboot, a German e-boat. A group of them managed to sink one of them and take 18 prisoners and drove the rest off. Um, her battle honours are North Sea, 1942 to 1945, but I, I find that a bit cruel because I think it should be 1940 to 1945. Uh, there were some distinctions when they were deciding battle honours, etc. And so that's the case of it. It is, but yeah, I think she deserved slightly more. She had a really interesting career and... It just... These ships just tickle me. Every time. They're just... Their service... And now we have HMS Bychester. 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 Depends on whether I'm pronouncing it with <clears throat> my father's inherited accent or my mother's inherited accent, what I how I pronounce it. She is a type two. Now, how did the type two differ from the type ones? They have six. Other four inch guns. Yeah, they get an extra twin mount. They still don't have torpedoes, but they do now have 110 depth charges, two throwers, and three racks, versus the previous ones, which had 40 depth charges, two throwers, and a single rack. Um, you sort of look at them and go, Hmm, there isn't much difference between, and we'll get into this when we get to the actual stats, much difference between a Type 2 and a Type 1. I wonder how many Type 1s were modified by their crew. I mean, I think the differential is roughly 50, 70 tons in standard, roughly, and I think it might be 120-ish tons in full load. I have to check, but... It's one of those scenarios where you sit there and go, hmm. It's 50 tons in standard, and it's 90 tons in full load. It's nothing in terms of ship tonnage. And yet, apparently, their firepower has gone up dramatically. Well, they got 50% more 4-inch guns, for starters. What... Does Biases to do? How does she survive till 1956? Does she, you know, spend her entire war hiding from the enemy and not doing anything? No. Uh, she takes part in operations in Gibraltar, in Malta, the Adriatic, Indian Ocean. Uh, at one point, she's escorting King George VI and Queen Elizabeth. That's the queen, uh, former Queen Mum. back to England after they'd visited Northern Ireland. Uh, then she does, well, she takes part as Operation Pedestal. She is non-stop operations. This is why she has North Africa, Malta Convoys, Mediterranean, South France, Adriatic and Aegean as her honours and awards. She is a war dog. She is laid down in May 1940. She's ordered in December 1939. Launched September 1941. Commissioned May 1942. It's one of the really interesting examples when you can go, hang on. Have the pressures of war slowed down the pace of construction of ships? Because if we consider it, consider how fast the Hunt 1s were completed versus the Hunt 2s. In some of my cases, it really does seem to have had an impact. Now, she's built by Hawthorne Leslie and Company at Heben on Tyne, rather than Camel Laird's. 
But she's still a good looking ship. And she's a very capable little ship. And then, well, let's get into these stats. As said, as said, the differential in standard is roughly 90 tons. The differential in... Well, between full load is... Well, the full load is 90 tons. The standard is 50 tons. Again, why am I reading my notes upside down? But what are the other differences? Well, they have the same engines. This is an interesting thing, because when you start to look in and go, well, you, you have the same engines, you have the same stuff, you have two shafts, you have 19,000 shaft horsepower, you have a top speed of 27 knots. In normal, you are 25 and a half knots fully loaded, and you have a range of roughly 3,600 nautical miles at 14 knots. This is all kind of interesting. What it also tells you, and I would say this is one of the more important things to tell you, is exactly the level of work which has been done in hull design, and also potentially gives you an idea of what were the realistic top speeds of the sloops. When we consider the shaft horsepower of the Hunt class, and the Egret class, you know, the Egret class is listed as for having 3,600 shaft horsepower for two shafts, geared steam turbines. The interesting thing is those turbines are the same pattern turbines, the same engine system, as are in the hunt. Egrets are interesting vessels. They are 84 meters long. The hunts are, well, if we consider these ones, they're 85.3 meters long. So yeah, slightly longer. That all has an effect on your design and your speed. But there are some serious questions you have to wonder about British sloops' designs and how much they were keeping to the treaties. Although, of course, none of those turbines still exist for us to test and see what they might have actually been capable of versus what they were claimed to be capable of. And they could do 19 and a quarter knots on... 3,600 shaft horsepower, and to do 27 knots, these required 19,000 shaft horsepower. Near enough five times, five, six times it. That's a, that's a big step up. Now, RP... I am not going to mangle that. I have already man managed to mangle so much language today with Polish. If Oh, I'm going to make it bad again, aren't I? I, I, I please note, I am trying. I am trying. Originally commissioned as the Beedar. Then transferred to become RP Slazek. Or, which is Polish, I'm told, for Silesian. So, Slazek. Um... She was laid down but transferred before completion to the Polish. And then after she was returned from Poland to Britain in 1946, she's transferred to India in 1953 as the INS uh, Godavari. And not scrapped until 1979. Although she was out of service from 1976 after she ran aground in Mal the Maldives. She took part in 32 patrols and 104 convoys after being commissioned on the 17th of April 1942. She was one of eight of the class that took part in the Iet raid. She managed to withdraw 85 soldiers from the Royal Regiment of Canada by going very close, under very heavy fire, and not quite beaching herself to getting uh, get them, but getting as close it was as it was physically possible for a hunt class to get. She supported landing on Sword Beach during D-Day. She was the lead destroyer for a flotilla of minesweepers which were going in to clear the route. That was kind of cool for the Polish to be leading 
the invasion of France and the, uh, therefore, the, uh, how to put this, uh, freeing of it from German control. After all, Germany had invaded for, in Poland first. During her career, she shot down definitely five aircraft, potentially three more. So, she should probably have been going around with sort of ace painted on her various places, but, you know, she's a warship. She doesn't get that. She served well. And she continued to serve well as the INS Godavari. So. Ah, HMS Tekop. Now, I put her in a second type 2, and I've everyone else I've kept to a couple of them for the class. And the reason I put her in was because I really wanted to illustrate the gunnery arrangement. Now, you will have now about heard me, if you've listened to many other videos, and my views on putting heavy armament aft. There are few ships for which I think this makes sense. But if you're an escort destroyer and your guns are primarily being carried along for anti-air and torpedo boat engagement, honestly, I can see the reasoning for it. I can also understand in terms of the design profile how it is easier to add it in and insert it there. It's not necessarily my preference, but it works. And on these ships, it makes sense because they are not theoretically built to go off attacking the enemy. They're not, their job is not to go and seeking out the enemy. Their job is to protect the fleet, to protect other ships, and to protect convoys, merchant ships. Therefore, that makes sense, having the armament like that. They can be making smoke and still using their four-inch guns to deter you. Whilst they're going away and keeping close to the merchant ships they're supposed to be protecting. It makes sense for that role. I'm still not particularly keen on it, but it makes sense. And in the case of Tekkot, which was scrapped in 1957, and this is one of the things that I want to emphasize about this class, they have a very long career. And if they survive, they hang around because they're useful. Tedcott, well, her honours are Libya, 1942, Mediterranean, 1942, Sicily, 1943, Salerno, 1943, Aegean, 1943, to 424, Anzio, 1944, Adriatic, 1944. She was built by J. Samuel White of Cows. She was ordered 20 December 1939. She's laid down 29th of July 1940. Launched 12th August 1941. Commissioned 2nd December 1941. It's one of those interesting things when we start talking about all the operations she takes part in and looking at the ships which she's so useful and the role she's so useful for. You start to realise that a point I've been trying to make in videos. That actually the movement of people from the capital ship, cruiser and carrier construction and trying to insert them into the escort construction process to speed it up did seem to actually lead to some delays because you were getting those people up to skill, uh, up to speed on constructing these smaller ships and transferring and moving them around. I can accept and I do understand the reasoning behind the decision. I don't agree with it, especially in terms of carriers for anti-submarine warfare and the Royal Navy's emphasis on carriers for maximization of force and especially considering what happens later, but the Royal Navy at the time were against it. So it seems to be problematic for me. And you might have 
things might have changed dramatically if the carriers had been excluded from that pausing of construction. But leaving that to one side, you have skilled people. You are growing the construction of escorts. Just shoving them across does not necessarily make sense and make it work. It needed slightly more thought applied to it, because I think that's the only way I can explain how this happened. But still, on the 4th of August 1942, Ted took part in an operation which I almost included in my book. Along with HMS Seek and Zulu, two tribal class destroyers, she stalked and attacked the U-372, German submarine. They forced her the U-boat to surface, and they managed to... I put this politely. Well, forced them to abandon ship. And the 16 of the German crew managed to be rescued, and a Leb Lebanese civilian. She had a very interesting career. She took part in operations ranging from hero to husky. She did most of it with the knife destroyer flotilla. But she moved around a bit as well. And she even escorted some convoys from... Well... From the Clyde to Cape Town. Although she did manage to do, uh, call in the Freetown on the way. So She had a really, really useful career. A really useful career. Ah, the type freeze. If you're looking at this, you're going to go, Alex, but they've been adding guns. Why? She's, lot, she's not got her gun. She's down to four again. Yes, because some point, someone decided, and I'm not sure which Bright Spark had this idea, but... Hang on, these are destroyers, and we have a big threat from German surface raiders. Okay, which might happen. They, you know, their cruisers keep coming out. We might need extra ships to be part of it. Okay, where's this going? We're going to add some torpedoes onto the hunt class. So you're going to have four inch, four four inch guns. Okay, in twin mounts. All right, you're going to have a quad pom pom. All right, two single twenty millimeters. Okay. You're going to carry 110 depth charges. Yeah, four throwers, three racks to deploy those. All looking good. And two 21 inch torpedoes? Yes. Has anyone ever suggested to you that possibly, possibly you are having too many bright ideas? I can understand this. This this does give them theoretically an anti-service capability. But it's also two torpedo tubes. Okay, let's say you had a flotilla of I don't know, four or five of these in in an operation. They'd be firing ten torpedoes. A single I class destroyer could chuck that many if it wanted to. From memory. It just, that's just the whole point of torpedoes is it's supposed to be a volume weapon you're chucking a large salvo of torpedoes at your opponent to guarantee a hit two torpedoes what are you going to be doing waiting till they get really close and then shooting down the down into the sort of the whites of their smokestacks it's just it strikes me so much as someone having the best of intentions, but not actually necessarily thinking it through. And, again, she's ordered July 1940, laid down August 1940, 
launched August 1941 and completed in February 1942. So a little over a year to construct, but again, they've got up a little pace once they get onto the uh, Type threes. She has an interesting service and is sunk in the Adriatic on the 14th of December 1944, if I remember correctly, to a mine. Yes, mine. She escorted multiple convoys in her career. She mainly worked with the 5th Destroyer Flotilla. At one point, she's of course transferred into the Royal Navy Adriatic Flotilla, which consisted of Alderham, Atherstone, which was another Hunt class, Aaron Vale, another Hunt class, Lamerton, a Type 2 Hunt class, Lauderdale, Hunt class, Wheatland, a Type 2 Hunt class, Wilton, a Type 2 Hunt class, Brocklesby, a Type 1 Hunt class, and Quantock, a Type 1 Hunt class, which were all under the leadership of Alderham. Commander, James Gerald Farrant. That flotilla actually captured uh, a German hospital ship, the Bonn, which was previously the Yugoslav steamship, the Sumeragia. And along with Atherstone, Alderham bombarded German units on the island of Rab on 9th December in support of Yugoslavian partisans. She had a very interesting career. But still, two torpedoes. I mean, there are torpedo... There are destroyers in Model 1 which are carrying more than that. There are torpedo boats going around which are carrying more than that. So let's consider the Type 3, and there are 28 of these built. You might have noticed that with each of the classes, I have listed off the number of them constructed. So 36 Type 2s, 20 Type 1s, 28 Type 3s. So between them all, carrying a wonderful amount of 56 torpedoes. I just thinking that the 16 tribal class destroyers between them probably carried almost twice that many. Again, torpedoes are a volume weapon. And when I say volume weapon, I mean Especially in this period, they're not particularly guided. They are developing guided torpedoes, they're developing seeking torpedoes, but they aren't particularly there yet. So these are point and shoot and hope to hit with a, the systems which will set themselves off or set them off. So you want to be able to shoot a salvo. If you've ever played a computer game where you're using a destroyer, torpedo, armed destroyer, you will know you launch a spread of torpedoes. You launch a salvo, a spread. Can we sit at both? The thing is, two torpedoes is not... It's not likely to hit. And actually maneuvering to get into torpedo range puts you at quite a lot of risk. And I would say these vessels were, even despite costing only £352,000, according to at least two books I've read. Uh, I'm not sure where the figure came from, but it was in a couple of books, and I just thought, hmm, I'll put it in. I'd still say the crew, the 168 crew, the ship itself, is valuable enough I'd prefer them not having a torpedo and not trying to, uh, to manoeuvre. Because again, the torpedo, is, torpedo launchers are in the center. If we go back to click back, thank you, to hit there up here. 
they're not space. So it's not as if it's you can say, well, they're to cover the rear if she's trying to withdraw. They're not. You have to show your you have to go beam on to your target to fire them. Again, it's the same power plant. It's the two free Admiralty free drum boilers supplying two Pearson's geared turbines, which drove two shafts with nineteen thousand shaft horsepower for a top speed of twenty seven knots or twenty five and a half knots if fully loaded. The Type Threes displaced 20 tons. I think no, exactly the same as the Type Twos, um, but they displaced a further eight tons fully loaded. So swapping out again, we can sit there and go. Well, the extra gun, an extra twin, t uh, the, the twin four-inch gun, extra pair of twin-inch, uh, twin four-inch, uh, extra pair of four-inch, extra twin four-inch, or you have the torpedoes. Which is more useful? To me, it would have been more useful to have had the extra guns. I don't think this... Uh, I hope this isn't going to be considered to be taking, apart, or taking anything away from the crews who suddenly did a wonderful job. I just think that, frankly, whoever was making the decisions of what to fit them with got uh, very worried that he that they were and it was probably it was, let's be honest at this time it was a he um, he was building destroyers without torpedoes and got so fixated on let's put some dis torpedoes on them didn't think hang on I'm only fitting two how helpful is this really going to be how much use is it really to have two more torpedoes now Holcomb pictured here she was, of course, torpedoed herself by U-593. She is laid, uh, ordered in August 1940, laid down April 1941, launched April 1942, commissioned September 1942, and sunk in December 1943. She's escorting a convoy um, of the KMS serial. KMS-34, along with... HMS Tyndale, which was another Hunt class destroyer, uh, escort destroyer. Now, Tyndale was escort was sunk by U five nine three, and so the other escorts of the convoy started hunting for U five nine three, but. U-593, while they were uh, while they're hunting it, managed to sink Holcomb as well. At this point, please note, USS Wainwright and HMS Culp, a, a Type 2 Hunt class destroyer, go... How do I put this politely? Uh, go on a hunting spree and manage to track down 593 on the following day um, with a huge number of torpedoes. Now, the thing is, despite Holcomb sinking rapidly, only 81 of her crew, so less than half, were lost. Which is a testimony to how well Alexander Stephen and Sons of Glasgow had built her. Considering a size. And now we have the Type 4s. Now, the Type 4s, I can honestly say, there are only two built. And they are built by Fornicroft. Now, Fornicroft are an interesting company because quite often the Royal Navy be ordering destroyers and ordering things. And Fornicroft will go, you know what, we can design something better than that. And sometimes, on quite disturbingly large number of occasions, in fact, they actually do design something better than that. But sometimes... Sometimes... They don't. Sometimes, they go off on their own little trip, and they manage to not do that well. Type 4 Hunt Class Destroyers, the fact that they're only... Two ordered 
and there are only two built. Kind of tells you which of the options this was. Why? Well, on the face of it, they have a tremendous amount of advantages. I'm not sure why that just flicked through. I didn't actually press anything. They have a tremendous amount of advantages. They have the gun armament of the Type 2s, and they have a better torpedo armament, a 50% better torpedo armament than the Type 3s, with three 21-inch torpedoes. If you notice I'm still not enamored with this quantity of torpedoes, there is a reason for it. It's really not enough. Um, I think probably, to my mind, the tribal class are carrying about the minimum. But they carry a far heavier gun armament. They were originally designed with 4.7 inch guns and whilst they do replace one of the twin 4.7s with twin 4 inch guns, they still have a far heavier broadside and far heavier capability in terms of fire. Plus, they are built as destroyers. They are very sturdily and strongly built destroyers. So they are built to take damage and getting close with the torpedoes. These are still being built as escort-grade destroyers. Someone is trying valiantly to promote them to what you would call small fleet destroyers. But the small fleet destroyers are looking and going, Hmm, our job's safe. You're excellent at the escort role, but you, you, you're not, you're not going to risk our job. Because, frankly, we have a lot more firepower than you do. Mm-hmm. And the other problem is this, you've, once you start putting in torpedoes, once you start putting in this sort of firepower, someone needs to have a conversation with you about um, your turbine shaft horsepower and your general top speed. Because the trouble is with HMS Brecken and her sister, Bizzardon, Bizzardon, is that they are interesting when it comes to their top speed. And I do remember these videos are supposed to be 20 minutes long. And there is no way the hunt class is going to be 20 minutes long. Mainly because I've done all four generations rather than just doing one. Now, why? Well, they've given the same engines as all the other hunt class. Yes, they displace more. In fact, these are the heaviest by a long way. 1,194 tons in standard. 1,586 tons fully loaded. They are starting to get up there with the small, small fleet destroyers. They are starting to fit into that size. But, no. It's really... Not enough. Their complement has grown, their armament has grown, and later on they will end up with four, or with well, six 20mm Oricons, uh, two singles, two twins. Again. Let me have, a, uh, have an argument of properly in the settings. It's supposed to be on manual transition. Using hot key, using my hotkeys. Okay. So I have no idea why it's doing an auto transmission. Or a transition. Uh, it's transitioning without me telling it to. Fun OBS. Stop causing me trouble. But it's not. It's not armed enough. It's. They've tried to produce a far more multi-purpose, a far more general purpose. And in many ways, they're trying to produce a tribal version of a hunt-class destroyer, or a hunt-class version of a tribal-class destroyer. And they haven't gone far enough. And one of the biggest problems for this ship is to drop down to 40 depth charges, two throwers, and one rack to do this. 
when you consider we've got 110 depth charges on both the Type 2 and Type 3. When we consider the Type 1 had 40 depth charges, two throwers and a rack, you've gone back to the original Type 1 base fit. And please note, I am calling this the base fit because I have absolutely no doubt after having looked at some of the pictures and accounts I have, have that at least depth charge quantity was adjustable. Um, possibly other systems were adjustable. If we go back to our earlier picture of the Type 1s, and you look at them, you sort of go, well, hang on, there is some space hanging on around there. There is space. There's space. Yes, it has its pom-pom mounted, as you can see, quite easily see, and it's got its 4-inch guns on the rear. But there's a lot of space after the 4-inch guns for the rack, and that theoretically only has one rack there, and you've got your throwers positioned further along the ship, towards midships. You've got space. Space that an enterprising crew can make use of. And then you've got the fact that the Type 2s and Type 3s are carrying 110 and carry multiple racks, both carrying three racks and two throwers, or four racks and three throwers, uh, four throwers and three racks, I mean. So, it's, it's a scenario here which I don't really accept that this was an improvement. I think, again, the same person who suggested... Again, it's doing the transitions. Why? Uh, the same person who suggested that the Type 3s uh, type needed torpedoes somehow was listened to by Fornicroft. And they went, well, we can go one better. We can give you something which is even more torpedoes. And the thing you want these ships for is escort destroyers to escort convoys. The thing you want them to do is deal with submarines and deal with aircraft. They're their primary threats. And if there's a surface threat shows up, if it's torpedo boats or other destroyers, then their guns theoretically can help them deal with them. If it's anything larger, have some proper destroyers along there. Have some fleet destroyers there. Have a cruiser around. That's the plan. This is about providing the mass. This is about providing the quantity for the convoy and the escort work and the fleet work and all all the duties require numbers of ships, especially when you're still getting sort of a Todoray concept, when you're getting all the stuff we take for granted under the summary warfare these days in terms of helicopters and sonar boys, etc., in place. And they don't come in place during World War II. They're they, many of them Cold War, World War II ideas, but Cold War before they're actually able to be implemented. This is about providing, making up for that lack of multiple sources of information gathering. You need more ships. You need more presence in terms of water. And you need these vessels out there for that. And this is the real problem, because... These vessels are laid down on 27th and 28th of February 1941. They are launched in 27th of June 1942 in the case of Brecon, 15th of September 1942 in the case of Brisbane. They are completed 18th of December 1942 in the case of Brecon, 12th of February 1943 in the case of Brisbane. They would be broken up in 1962 and 1965, respectfully. But both we paid off, well, quite quickly. One's paid off on the 4th of December 1945, uh, in terms of Brecon. And Brisbane actually does survive, I suppose, a little bit longer. Actually, she gets to make it to the 19th of June 1948, before she's paid off. I could forgive them if trying to be a tribal, well, a hunt-class tribal or a the tribal version of a hunt class was their only problem. I could forgive it. I could even, to an extent, overlook the fact that 
three torpedoes is no better than two torpedoes in terms of armament and point, almost pointlessness of the weight it takes up. What I can't really forgive, though, is Fornicroft are a very experienced constructor. And yet, one of these vessels can do 950 nautical miles at 25 knots, and the other one, 1,175 nautical miles at 25 knots. Uh, you're going to sit there and look at me and go, but Alex, that's only a difference of 225 nautical miles. What is that really as a difference between, you know, friends? And considering the time spent, you know, to complete Briston, Briston versus Brecon, you know, maybe they, they put in better components and they made it better. I, I agree, there's quite a good possibility of that, but that's still a difference of 225 nautical miles. And the point is, this is a class of two, a subclass of two, built by the same frigging builder. If you were going to expect any ships to have the same stats in the class, in terms of operation, it would be these two. They are started one day apart. They are started one day apart. One, uh, Brecon is laid down on 27th of February, Brisbane on the 28th of February. A, the reason Brisbane takes so much longer than Brecon escapes me. I did look to see if the yard was particularly attacked. They're built by Fornicroft at Southampton, so, you know, that there are options there for that, but doesn't seem to be. They both have a top speed of 26 knots. They both have, when fully loaded, a top speed of 25 and a half knots. And yet, one can do 225 nautical miles more than the other at 25 knots in terms of range. So do they carry different fuel tanks? Doesn't seem so. The going through the designs as much as I have, the difference between the two does not seem that great, that massive. Ultimately, when you look at them, they are the furthest apart of any class, uh, in divergence of any of the classes. And we are talking about ships which are built by John Brown and Company, Camel Laird, Fairfield Shipbuilding Engineering Company, Hawthorne Les and Leslie and Company, Scott Shipbuilding Engineering Company, Alexander Stevens and Sons, Swan Hunter. J. Samuel White, Vickers Armstrong, Yarrow Ship uh, Yarrows, all of these yards manage to do something which Fornicroft don't. They keep their ships to the pattern. So Fornicroft go off and go, actually, we have an idea for a better hunt class. Let us build our two. And we'll show you how much better they're gonna be. Fine. You want to? Do it. Go on, go build them. And they get them this different. In peacetime, when Fornicroft experiment, it's interesting. And it produces some of the Royal Navy's most interesting and innovative ideas long term. In wartime, when they innovate, it's usually pretty good. So again, my question is, what happened here? Why? And the pressures of war building destroyers okay escort destroyers not the normal thing that Hornicroft usually build the most aggressive destroyers they can build it's an argument between them and jess why does the who builds the meanest tardest toughest destroyers but leaving that to one side what happens here What happens? They are otherwise acceptable ships. I, again, I think the emphasis on torpedoes is far too great for their role. 
I think that they were originally originally completed with a quad Vicar 0.5 inch Vickers machine gun set. Here. Machine gun is really worrying. I'm not sure who specced that in, but honestly, the Royal Navy basically started abandoning that in 1939. Um, <laughs> how that was still knocking around at that point to be fitted, I do not know. Um, and I fitted it to two twins, and I sit there and go, "Well, that's okay for torpedo boats, but it's a this is a destroyer." And this is going to be a big, hefty destroyer compared to its counterparts. 86 of the class, 86, were created. They served in World War II with the Royal Navy, with the Royal Hellenic Navy, the Polish Navy, the Royal Norwegian Navy, and the Free French. And of all of them, all of them, the two I have the most difficulty justifying. I can, to an extent, understand the idea of the Type threes because I'm thinking maybe the person looking at them was thinking, hang on, what about for Far Eastern deployments and when we're having to move into the ocean? Yes, having torpedoes then might be useful because we, you know, there's so much, so greater distances and... Also supporting convoys and German surface raiders. The gra what happens if things like the Graf Spey get out again? Let's put some torpedoes in there because at least then they have something. I can, I can, I can tell you that logic is absolutely absurd once you consider the quantity of torpedoes you're putting in there. But I can see the idea behind it. They are interesting little ships. They really are. And one of the interesting things here is this painting. I always find this painting interesting. It's of a hunt class destroyer. And it's it hung hangs in Greenwich. And it shows one in dry dock. What is interesting about it is it shows that there's a single 20mm being added on the front. That's not part of any of the official fits. I would say this looks to me like a Hunt, probably Hunt 2. Consider, I, I'd say for its gun armor, it might be a Hunt 1, but I'd say it's a Hunt 2. And it's got an extra 20mm sitting there in the painting. And ultimately, this is why I think this class was quite so good. Because sloops are built to be adaptable. This class were built to be escorts from the get-go, hence they got the destroyer title. But, and I say this with all due emphasis, their crews adapted them. They found ways of improving them. And they could do so because of the structure of the ship. British ships were built strong. They were built rugged. One of the interesting things when you start looking at the British ships compared to their counterparts is that often counterparts from other navies have a sort of really grabbing, you know, eye-catching centerpiece of what they're built around in concepts. You know, the Germans have the large guns. You know, some of the navies have very large numbers of torpedoes or very high speed. British ships are built as all rounders from the get go. They are built to be very rugged, very easily fixable, and built to be fairly good, but maybe not the best, at pretty much everything. And the Hunt class to me typified us. Their service in World War II, they are not, and there's a reason why I called the Black Swans the F-22s of anti-submarine warfare in World War II. They were. As 
if you were a submarine and a black swan group was hunting you, you were in trouble. You were... You, basically, you would either have to pull off something which would be against the laws of physics, or be incredibly lucky to manage to dodge that group. But to that extent, there is an argument that the Hunt class are the F-35s. Bear with me. The F-35s are these very capable aircraft. I know we like to make a lot of jokes about them, but they are actually very capable. They are incredibly complicated because they are supposed to be all-rounders, and making an all-round aircraft is very, very difficult. Yes, they've got stealth, and that's partially their party piece, but the thing is, stealth was supposed to be an adjunct to them also being, to an extent, the successor to the Harrier and the F-16. They were supposed to be something which could do pretty much all jobs fairly decently, like the F-16, and to an extent like the Harrier. The Harrier's party piece was it was able to do Vistal, vertical takeoff and sh uh, vertical takeoff and landing, or short takeoff and landing. The F-35's party pieces, it can do this, it, it, variants can do Vistal, but all of them are stealthed, but they are also, like the F-16, able to do pretty much all the other jobs. And that's good. That's useful. That's essential. An aircraft, though, is still going to get some attention because it's still got the glamour of flying through the sky, being like a bird. The idea, the concept of the pilot is a glamorous thing. But the thing about the Hunt class is they don't get that glamour. I talk about this on this channel far too or, so often that people must think I, you know, spend my life bumping into people who don't understand naval history, and I, it's not that case at all. But I am amazed regularly whenever I do teaching on naval history. Once I start bringing up the smaller class of vessels, the fact that it's almost a shibboleth in terms of, oh, you know them, ah, you are, and you are interested in naval history, versus, oh, you were just feigning interest in naval history. Because you ask someone to pick their favourite battleship on Twitter, there's going to be lots of people coming up with ideas. Favourite battlecruiser? Yeah, lots of them. Ask them to pick their favourite destroyer. I can guarantee they'll pick one of three classes for the vast majority of them. Me, I'm pretty much predictable on what I'm going to pick. I literally wrote a book about my three favourite classes. You know, that that's there. But if you ask me to pick my top ten, ooh, I could do that. But it's going to be a lot more complicated. And for most people, they're going to pick the famous ones. And there are very few famous destroyers. There are enough. But there are some. But there's very few. Why? Because a lot of what these ships do is not exciting. A lot of what they do is just being there in case something happens. A lot of what they do is the mundane task, the escorting, the presence. They're there. They escort the convoy the whole way across the Atlantic. They don't just appear because there's a major surface raider in the area or there's a threat of submarines. Uh, that a pack of submarines have been noted coming, so one of the you're, uh, it's one of the surge escort groups being sent to reinforce. They are there the whole way. With the convoys up the east coast, they get so little attention. When we're talking about sort of the big budget war history, you know, doc. Uh, I'm not sure if we call them doc documentaries or docudramas. They don't get the attention. Because they don't go to far off exotic lands, they don't do anything amazing that we can all sort of go, oh, wow. They are literally taking coal to Newcastle. It's necessary. You need the coal, you need the iron, you need all the materials that move to Newcastle. 
But it's not exactly the most exciting topic. And some days, they'll be fine. All their threat will be mines. Some days, they will get the absolute German kitchen sink thrown at them. They will get fighter attacks. They'll get bomber attacks. They will get torpedo, uh, some, uh, torpedo boats attacking. They'll get submarines attacking them. They'll have mines. They'll have everything chucked at them. And then what do they get? They get battle honours for all those engagements where they have the entire kitchen sink chucked at them? No. They don't. They get the North Sea. 1942 to 1945. Because if a battleship's not there, are you sure it's really a battle? At least a cruiser has to be there for it to be a battle, surely. So, question. Now, my question could be about the Fornicroft Type 4s. Honestly, there are so many questions I could ask about those, but realistically, I'm going to ask this question. I think I've already asked it before, but I want to. I, I saw some interesting responses, and I want, so I want to ask it again. Or rather, I'll ask a variation of it. Can't all the ordering back a year? So the British are ordering these ships instead of 1939, 1938. So you get them all entering service as they did on their previous re previous period, but a year earlier. Everything is a year earlier. And you could do it without moving the capital ship or carrier construction. What do you think happens? What do you think happens if you move the ordering back a year? For the hunts, for the flowers, for the black swans. Do you think the world reacts in fear? Do you think the world takes any notice at all? Do you think the Royal Navy, therefore, I agree with me, that it would have been far better prepared for World War II? Or do you think it would still find itself in a similar situation. Do you think Churchill makes the same decision to pause carriers and capital ship construction because that's what he did in World War One, and so therefore that's what he does in World War Two, Or do you think he goes, hang on, we actually have escorts in service, um, we don't need to pause some construction. And what effects does that have on World War Two? I'd be really interested to hear what you think. I might actually do a I might actually do a video a live and a long patrol long patrol on that topic of what happens if you can't escort back a year as a video during the Christmas period and again if you'd like that as an if like that as an idea please put that below thank you very much for watching I hope you enjoyed and uh, well what have we got coming up no. Yeah, and go forward. Thank you. Uh, well, I know next week I have capital ships of science fiction, battle stars, uh, uh, battle stars versus star destroyers, and I also know that next week is HMS Formidable from 1898, and I know that Wednesday's, Wednesday's video will be re-recording of the Nelson HMS Nelson from 1876 video, and there is also a Wednesday video coming up which is going to be. Hmm. There was a, there's a topic which has been going around my head for a while. I have sp I have replied in a comment that I think I'll do a video about this topic. I cannot remember it for the life of me, but I have got noted down. It's been one of those weeks. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed this. I did record this before I left for, uh, for the whole sort of two week running around period for my mum and sister, uh, mum and aunt's. Uh, birthday bonanza. I didn't like it though. So, after arguing with it, I re-recorded everything from scratch. Hope you enjoyed. Thank you very much for watching. Take care.